Straight Shift. With the Car Chick, the podcast that's all about cars, buying, selling, fixing, and driving. And sometimes pretty fast to hear the Car Chick. Now, here's he is. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Straight Shift. I know that I like to use this podcast to give you guys really good, useful information that's going to help you save time, money, some sort of aggravation when buying or selling or maintaining your cars or how to stay safe while driving. Really important, useful information. But sometimes we just have to have a little fun, and that's what we're going to do today. In the words of William Shakespeare, what's in a name This is from his play, Romeo and Juliet. And granted, the bard was talking about roses, but me, I'm talking about cars. I name my cars. I've done this for at least 20 years. I've become known for it, or maybe infamous is the right term. But I have this thing about naming cars. Back when I was in high school, and we are not going to talk about how long ago that was, one of my good friends, Mike Krasoska, had a red Chevy Monza two-door coupe. And this is a mid to late 70s car. The, the Monza Coupe was from about 75 to 1980, and it was based on the Chevy Vega platform. They shared the same wheelbase and the same totally pitiful 2300cc inline four-cylinder engine. But it was this, I just remember it being this monstrosity of a car. And because it was a Chevy Monza, we called it Mondale. It was just the most appropriate name for that car. It it fit that car's personality. Now, I can't really talk. My parents had a lime green Chevy Vega when I was little. And one of my very first memories is of sitting in the car dealership in some hard plastic chair, of course, while we were, they had bought it and we were waiting for it, I think, to get cleaned up and delivered. I don't know, things, you know, from that long ago, my brain are probably scrambled, but I just, I have that memory of my parents trading in the Ford Country Squire station wagon that they used to have, and they traded that in on the lime green Chevy Vega. That thing was absolutely hideous. And of course, as a toddler, I absolutely loved it. But I didn't start actually naming my cars until, like I said, about 20 years ago. But now I firmly believe that everyone should name their car. You probably think that's a little bit weird, but it's really not. We as humans have named things forever. It's what we do. Giving something a name is to give it an identity, and it helps to establish its uniqueness, whether we're naming fruits and vegetables so that we can distinguish between an apple and an orange, or we're naming car models because we need to be able to brand them and trademark them. We name businesses. We name countries. We name vehicles. We name pets. Of course, you know, we also name babies. That's important, too. Even as kids. We often named our stuffed animals and other toys. And as adults, hey, you know, we're still naming our toys. It's something that humans have always done to make it easier to describe things and identify them and make them more unique. And there is a long, long history of naming vehicles, starting with ships. Almost every watercraft, be it civilian or military, has been named and very often ceremoniously, ceremonially, it's a hard word to say, named before it is launched into the water. However, unlike the casual naming of vehicles like cars, you know, at sea, the process of naming a ship has been a very important and often colorful event. Traditionally, the ship naming and launching ceremonies, they had a meaning where it brought good fortune and safety to the new ship and its crew and its passengers. That tradition dates back thousands and thousands of years. There's evidence of ancient Babylonians celebrating ship naming and launchings as far back as the third millennium BC. So as humans, we've been doing this a long, long time. And there's a reason for this. It, while the decisions around 
building ships and how you engineer them. That's been based on science. And it's one of the most impressive feats of engineering, I think, that we have accomplished as humans. But the naming of the ships and the ceremonies around that is based more on beliefs and customs and even superstitions. And that's why these ceremonies in the past were mainly performed by religious officials because it had to do with blessing the ship and asking whatever gods of the time for protection for the ship and for the people within it. Ships have always been so critical to the survival of humanity. Our ancient ancestors built their communities on the shores because the sea provided for us. Fishing was a primary means to feed the village. Sailing enabled easier trade among different villages and tribes that lived in the different sea communities. It also enabled warfare, but we don't have to talk about that. But the bottom line is ships were essential tools of our ancient societies, much as they still are today. But back then, even though boats and ships represented some of our absolute best knowledge of science and engineering, seafaring was still really, really dangerous. We couldn't control the ocean and the weather and everything. So taking a ship out onto the sea was kind of a big deal, just as it still is today, but more so for our ancient ancestors. The deadliest catch was kind of their normal way of life. And then giving a name to the ship was believed to identify that vessel uniquely to the gods that they were asking for that protection and good fortune. So that is where the tradition came from. And each civilization had its own way of naming the ships and their own traditions for the launching ceremonies. The Vikings, who of course were known for shipbuilding, of course being from Scandinavia, which is completely surrounded by water on most sides, they had a tradition of spilling blood. This was back in the 8th to 11th century AD. They like to spill blood and have this big ceremony, but the Vikings were kind of badass. Then later on, they substituted wine for blood sacrifices. So that was that was a little bit nicer. And that tradition has continued to modern day with the smashing of a giant bottle of champagne on the bow of the ship to christen it. And speaking of launching the ships, that was not an easy task. It often took every single able-bodied person to, with giant ropes, literally drag the vessel from the shore where they built it into the water. So the whole community had to turn out for this anyway because it took everybody to get the heavy thing into the water. So you might as well have a lot of fanfare around it. Now that fanfare continues today, although granted with a little less violence and more wine, but the naming and launching ceremonies have become quite prestigious affairs, and not just anybody can get invited to one of these things. They represent the success and the efforts of the ship designer, the ship builders, the owners who paid for it, and of course, the crew that will be operating the ship. It's a big deal. And on launch day, they often decorate the ships with flags and ribbons and, you know, deck them up like party floats. And the ceremony is accompanied by musicians and just a whole lot of pomp and circumstance. But it's still a big deal to transfer, to transfer said new ship from the dry dock into the water. And there's several ways to do this, none of which are particularly graceful. You'd be surprised, even in with all the modern technology today, it still essentially involves dumping the ship, a controlled dump, mind you, but a dump nonetheless, either stern first, meaning the butt end of the ship, or sideways into the water, which tends to result in a resounding sploosh. Now, smaller boats, you got to differentiate between boat and ship here, but smaller boats can be put into the water with cranes, et cetera. And there's those things usually don't go wrong, although they sometimes do. But getting a large, true ocean faring ship into the water is still a big deal. Modern technology has significantly reduced the chances for error, but kind of hilariously, accidents do occasionally happen. Anything from the ship actually tipping over too far and capsizing to the wave of displaced water 
going over a neighboring dock and wiping everything out over there. If you go on YouTube and search for the top ship launching fails, it's kind of entertaining. But even when things go right, it's still a pretty exciting and dramatic event. So how are ships named? And there's a reason that I'm going through this history. We'll bring it back to cars, but this history is important to understand why we name things and why I name cars the way that I do. And I'm going to teach you my methodology in a little bit. So there's no true formal procedure for naming a ship, at least not universally. Naming a civilian ship is entirely up to the owner of said ship. So private individuals, like maybe you own a boat that you take out on the lake and, you know, go skiing or fishing or whatever. That's the name of that boat is something that you personally choose. A lot of people decide to name a boat after a loved one or something that is particularly meaningful to them. Sometimes they they like to just come up with, you know, cheesy plays on words. Some of the best that I have seen, there's a boat called Bacon in the Sun, as in bacon. I thought that was kind of cute. And there's one called Ships and Giggles that I have seen. I thought that was hilarious. And There's also one that I saw called Best of Boat Worlds. Har, har, har. Sometimes it's related to the owner's professions. Lawyers, oh my gosh, lawyers are notorious for coming up with totally cheesy legal themed names for their boats. I have seen one named My Alibi, although that might not have been a lawyer, that might have been a criminal, I'm not entirely sure. But I did know of one named Billable Hours. That was the name of a boat that a friend of mine owned when we were kids, actually his dad's boat. His dad was a lawyer. So that was really hilarious. But corporations, of course, they tend to name their ships based on something related to their company or to their brand. Cruise ships are a great example of this. And I love cruising. Actually, right now, I am supposed to be on a cruise to Alaska. Thank you, COVID-19, for canceling my Alaskan vacation. But I've been on a lot of cruises in my life, and it's my favorite way to travel. And so The naming of cruise ships has always been special to me, and they tend to all name them based on a naming schema that ties back to their brand. So we travel on Princess Cruise Lines, so everything is the something princess, the island princess, the dawn princess, the royal princess, the diamond princess, whatever. You know, Royal Caribbean is always something of the seas. So that way, when you see the ship's name, you know how to associate it with the parent company's brand. It's just good business. Now, the procedures for naming military vessels, that varies from country to country. In the U.S., Navy vessels are named by the Secretary of State, typically under the direction of the president, but in line with documented rules for naming different categories of ships. So, for example, U.S. Navy ships tend to be named after prominent geological locations, names of previous remarkable ships. So they'll recycle. Like I think there have been at least two, probably three USS Enterprises, not counting the one that Captain Kirk flew. Um, The names of great naval leaders, national figures, sometimes deceased members of the Navy and the Marine Corps who, you know, got the Medal of Honor or otherwise have been honored for their contribution to our nation. I think that's wonderful. So that's how at least the U.S. names their military vessels. But in ancient times, ships were very often named after the goddesses or other mythical figures that the people were asking for protection. And even though a ship, whether back then or today, may be named after a man, or maybe it has a totally gender neutral name that doesn't have anything to do with a a human or anthropomorphized thing, but... Ships have always traditionally been considered female. So if you ask any sailor, they will almost always refer to their ship using female pronouns. Oh, she's a good ship. Or, hey, she'll do 30 knots, even with a headwind. Or they'll say, oh, we got to you know take care of her. They refer to the ship as female. So why is that? Well, it goes back to the whole seeking protection thing. Things like nurturing and caring and protecting have always been associated with women and our role as mothers. You know, mama bear. Nobody protects more than mama bear does. And since the ships needed to protect the lives and well-being of the people aboard it, it just became a tradition to refer to them as female, to take that protecting and caring characteristics of women and anthropomorphize it onto the ships. And furthermore, the the gods that 
ancient peoples would ask for protection usually were the female gods like Athena. Um, she was the goddess of war, but also of protection. So this is just a, an old tradition of women being associated with not only nurturing, but fiercely protecting. So why am I telling you about all this? Again, this is, we're talking about ships, but this is also why I name my cars female names most of the time. So I'm going to take a really quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some famous cars with names and why I name my cars. And I'm going to share with you the methodology that I use in case you would like to name your car. So we'll be right back after this. Do you hate car shopping? Do you worry about being taken advantage of or about finding the right car at a great price? Buying a car can be a frustrating and time-consuming experience. But what if you could get a great deal without having to do a ton of research, without having to haggle, and without the fear of buying a lemon? You can. As your personal car shopper, the Car Chick will help you pick the perfect car based on your unique lifestyle, budget, and personality. She'll handle all of the legwork and negotiating for you. All you have to do is sign the papers and take the keys. It's that easy. To learn how the Car Chick can save you time, money, and hassle on your next car purchase, give us a call at 704-248-8706. That's 704-248-8706. Or visit us on the web at thecarchick.com. Where the rubber meets the road. Nice to meet you. Love your asphalt. Hey, nice treads. It's Straight Shift with the Car Chick. Everyone, and welcome back to the Straight Shift. I hope you didn't mind my sharing the history of why and how we name ships, ocean-faring vessels, because that tradition is a big part of my justification for why I name my cars. And I am not the only one who has come up with names for cars. So I'm not uniquely weird in this aspect. There have been many famous cars that have had specific names throughout history. And I'm not talking about the model names like Mustang or the Corvair or the Escape. I'm talking about people sounding names for the cars. And this is mostly due to movies and television, right? Because we have used cars as characters in movies and TV. Herbie the Love Bug, that 1963 VW Beetle that had a mind of its own, that was the, probably the car that started my love of cars. I mean, this was, it was, first of all, it was cute. Granted, you know, I saw these movies for the first time when I was a toddler. So, you know, this little round VW Beetle, which my neighbors had one too. So I think that's why I associated it because I knew a car that looked like that. So hence I had this obsession with VW Beetles when I was a child. But Herbie the Love Bug definitely did it for me. Snarky little car, had a mind of its own, raced itself. I mean, what's not to love there, right? Then Stephen King brought us Christine in his novel and subsequent movie. Christine was a 1958 Plymouth Fury. But here's the interesting part. In the book, Christine was a four-door sedan, but that was a mistake. Stephen King did not do his homework. He may be the epitome of the horror writer, but I don't know that he's a car guy because he made a big mistake with this. The four-door version of the Plymouth Fury didn't come out until 1959. So there's a mistake in the novel. Doesn't make it any less scary. But when they turned that into a movie, they ended up using a hardtop coupe so that Christine could stay true to the 1958 model year. But she wasn't the sedan. So that was 1959. But again, I'm such a nerd that I know these things. Then there are cartoon car characters, of course. Disney has made, what, three movies about this now called Cars? And these are some of my favorite Disney movies, of course. You know, Lightning McQueen is adorable. But my personal favorite is Mater. You gotta love Mater. He's just hilarious. Then on television, we had Kit. You remember the TV show Knight Rider from the 80s? Okay, maybe some of you are not old enough to remember this, but this was one of my favorite shows when I was a kid, along with Star Trek and other nerdy things. But... 
Kit was an autonomous 1982 Pontiac Firebird that was powered by an artificial intelligence known as the Knight Industries 2000. So that's where they came up with Kit. It was an acronym. And it was brilliantly voiced by British actor William Daniels. I mean, he really made that whole series because he made Kit snarky and condescending and superior and you know very much kind of like C-3PO was in Star Wars, but way more competent. <laughs> so that's what made him so funny. And of course, Kit had to have an evil twin because what science fiction-ish type show isn't complete without the whole evil twin thing. And that was called CAR, K-A-R-R, the Night Automated Roving Robot. And just so you know, I did not actually have to research any of this information for this podcast. This dumb, nerdy stuff is actually stuck in my brain from my childhood. So the Knight Rider series was uh, rebooted, but thank God, short-lived in 2008. Eight. They did it as a made-for-TV movie first, and that served as the pilot for the series, which thankfully only lasted one season. It was really terrible. But Kit, at that point, stood for the Night Industries 3000. Oh, isn't that clever? But it was based on the newly released Shelby GT500KR. Because that entire show was nothing more than a commercial for that car. Now, granted, the Shelby GT500KR awesome vehicle, totally beautiful. And it was, if you just turned down the volume and didn't listen to the horrible script and the bad acting, the car was actually really pretty to watch, you know, for at least a few minutes, but it didn't have a plot to speak of. It only lasted one season. So that didn't work. Now, the remake of the movie Gone in 60 Seconds was one of the best, I think, movie reboots, and that is probably what got me started naming my cars and specifically naming my cars female names. I mean, who does not remember Eleanor, the 1967 Shelby GT500 that was Nicolas Cage's character's absolute nemesis? That was the car that he always got busted stealing. And interestingly, Eleanor in the original 1974 movie, she was actually a 1971 Mustang Sport Roof that had been redressed as a 73 Fastback model. So that car kind of sort of didn't really exist, but that was before product placement drove absolutely everything and she was still totally, totally beautiful. So, but in the 2000 remake, she was a 67 Shelby GT500. And she was that that beautiful dark gray that almost had a green undertones to it. Such a pretty color. So that is Eleanor. And she is one of the most famous cars in movie history. Now, all of the cars that they stole <laughs> in Gone in 60 Seconds, and I am not condoning Grand Theft Auto here. However, the reason that the car theft team referred to, they named all the cars on their list. They had to steal, was it 50 cars in one night? And so they named them all female names so that when they were communicating with each other and back to home base, which car they were, which team was stealing at that moment, they could say, hey, I'm picking up Lisa or I'm picking up, you know, Julie. So that if anyone was listening, particularly the cops on the airwaves, it didn't sound like, hey, I'm stealing cars. It sounded very innocuous, like you're picking up a lady for a date. So this was the rationale that was used in the movie. Again, I am not condoning Grand Theft Auto, but it's it's why they gave the cars all women's names. And that's kind of what stuck with me. And that's one of the reasons that I decided to, when I named my cars, most of them all have female names. Now, naming Cars is become very, very common just through the general population. Again, it is not just me being weird, but it's become so common that there is a national Name Your Car Day. It's October 2nd every year, National Name Your Car Day. I did not start that, although I wish I could take credit for it, but there's like a national day for pretty much everything these days. So like January 2nd is National Cream Puff Day. I could totally get behind that. On the other hand, April 24th is National Hairball Awareness Day. That's kind of every day in my house. I have two cats. Now, June 7th is National VCR Day, and I'm not really sure that that's relevant anymore. They might want to change that to maybe National, it's not even DVD Day, because that's even passe now. I'm not even sure what you make that. But okay, I digress. October 2nd, National 
name your car day. And I do strongly believe that everyone should name their car. And you do not have to wait to October 2nd to do it. Do it now. Do it when you buy your new car. Do it. Name the car that you have already. Why do I feel so strongly about this? Naming your car makes it more special. It encourages you to bond with this machine. And it implies something of a commitment to it. Psychological studies actually reveal that when we name inanimate objects, like our cars, you know, we're assigning almost human-like attributes to it, but somehow that makes us feel more in control of said machine, <laughs> which when you're driving a car, you are in control, but there is a synergy, a relationship between the driver and the machine that you know, for those of us who race that that synergy you you kind of become one with the car and it is a relationship that is very important because you are in control but when you're driving at those absolute limits of physics that control can go to hell in a handbasket really really fast and bad things can happen and so we tend to trust the car to also take care of us. So we do have a weird relationship with our race cars when we race. So that definitely is part of our psychosis. But I believe that if you name your car, just like you name your kids or you name your pets, that makes your car a member of your family. So maybe that will encourage you to take the best possible care of it. And therefore, in turn, it will take good care of you. It will last. It might not break down on you. It will keep you safe. Hopefully, it will not cost you an arm and a leg in repairs. My car, Maggie, is an excellent example of that. Maggie is a 2004 Mini Cooper S hardtop. Now, the 2004 Mini Cooper S is on the Consumer Reports list of the 10 least reliable cars that you could possibly purchase or own. Yet Maggie has given me relatively little grief over the years. I've had her since 2007. Okay, both window motors went out before 30,000 miles, and the over-engineered hydraulic engine mounts don't last very long. Thank you, German over-engineering. But I haven't experienced the major problems that most Mini Cooper S owners from 2004 have experienced, like oh, say the loose timing chains or the hemorrhaging water pumps, all of which lead to blow up at motors. Yeah, I haven't had to deal with that. And I fully believe that I haven't had that many problems with Maggie. Despite putting her on the racetrack and driving her around town like a bat out of hell, but Maggie knows that she is loved. She knows how much she means to me. And therefore, she's a good girl and she doesn't break down. Okay, being married to a master certified mechanic who maintains her within an inch of her life probably has something to do with it too. But I have had relatively little problems with her compared to other Mini Coopers. And I think it's because she knows she's loved. I even referred to her by name when I did the Speed Channel's TV show. It's a reality show called Are You Faster Than a Redneck? Yeah, Google that. It was hilarious. It only lasted one season, but uh, it was back in, what, 2013. Uh, comedian John Reap uh, was the host, and it was really fun because I got to work with him, and I got to work with John Snyder and um, Kenny Wallace. It was just it was a really fun experience, but uh, Maggie, as a result, became the most famous Mini Cooper in the country. And for a while, she actually had more followers on Facebook and Twitter than I did. But that's okay. So let's talk about how you can name your car. I'm going to give you my methodology. And you don't have to follow this. There aren't any rules. It's entirely up to you. And you should go with what sounds and feels right to you. But if you need a place to start, this is how I do it. As I said, most of the cars that I have personally named have been female, but that's just my personal preference as well as a nod to tradition and gone in 60 seconds. But your car may be female. Your car may feel like it's more male or your car may not have a specific gender. All of the above is totally okay. But what I do is I take the first letter of either the make or the model and then I kind of play with names that start with that letter until something feels right. And sometimes I just immediately know what the right name for a car is. And sometimes it takes a while to kind of bond with the car and let the car tell me. And I got to play around with it a little bit. But let me give you an example. 
my Porsche back that I had in, uh, bought in 2000, Porsche P. So I named her Penelope. Don't ask me why. That's just one of the things that popped into my head and I immediately knew. And I actually knew before I bought her that that's what her name was going to be. I knew I was like, I wanted a Porsche, damn it. And her name was going to be Penelope. So I tend to pick unusual names too. For some reason, just, it just feels right for some reason. It makes them that much more special. So that was an example of taking the first letter of the make, Porsche P, Penelope. Now, we also had, at the time, a BMW M3. So I took the M from M3, and I named her Madeline. And so we called her Maddie for short, and Penelope was Penny for short. So we had Maddie and Penny, and they liked to play together on the racetrack. They were very cute together. So (laughs) they were best friends. Then I had an Infiniti G35 Sport Coupe that I named Isabel. So again, it's just something that felt right the day that I bought her. When I married my husband, David, you know, him being a mechanic and as big of a car nerd as me, he was perfectly happy to jump on this whole name your car bandwagon. And he even adopted my methodology. So he has a custom built um, that he built literally from the ground up, a turbocharged Toyota Tercel. This thing is as fast as Maggie is on the racetrack. It's really kind of scary. (laughs) But her name is Tracy. And at that time when we met, he also had a 92 Acura Integra. Now I named her, I named her Alice. It just, she just kind of had an attitude about her and Alice just seemed like a good name. But now he drives, we still have Tracy, but now he drives a third gen Mitsubishi Eclipse. And so we took the E and named her Elena. Again, I kind of picked out that name, but he liked it. So he was totally on board with that. Now I also had a 2005 Dodge caravan (laughs) that I inherited from my father. It was his golf mobile. And when he passed, my mom and I got it, but I ended up selling it to my father-in-law because he, his Dodge van died. Imagine that. And he needed a vehicle for all of his band equipment because that's his big hobby. He has a band, but I named the minivan Doris. Doris just sounded like a really good name for a minivan. And Doris is still in our family and we still take great care of her. And I borrow her back when it's race weekend. She makes a great racing support vehicle. I throw the air mattress in the back of her and I can actually sleep in her at the racetrack running the air conditioning all night. So I don't sweat to death when we race in the middle of the summer. So Doris, very, very reliable, but you don't mess with her. She's, she's got an attitude. I actually have more speeding tickets in Doris than I do in Maggie. It's really sad, but this is kind of the naming scheme. Is this starting to make sense? And it's not limited to cars. I named the motorcycles too. So we have a Honda ST1300 motorcycle. It's named Stacy. It came out of the ST. That wasn't all that creative, but it was something that just made sense. So now some of my friends have named their cars totally independent before they even knew me. So I cannot take the credit or the blame for this. I've got a friend, Amanda, who also drives a Mini Cooper and her Mini Cooper's name is Babs. And Babs is really cool. And Babs and Maggie totally get along, even though they don't get to see each other as often as they would like, especially now with COVID. But naming Mini Coopers, that is actually a tradition that the Mini brand strongly encourages and even weirdly encourages. They have a field in their computer system. So if you own a Mini and you call a Mini dealership, when, when you buy it, they ask you what the car's name is and they actually can put it in there and you kind of get this little birth certificate. It's really hilarious. But it goes into their system. So when your car is due for service, they call you and say, hey, Maggie's due for service or hey, Babs is due for service. And they just refer to your car by its name. So that's just a mini Cooper thing. But, you know, we mini people are kind of a members of a, it's a kind of a cult. It just is. We're all really weird, but that's okay. We love our cars. So I do help other people name their cars as well. So if you don't come up with the name for your car and you're one of my clients, you're at the risk of me naming it for you. So I strongly encourage you to name your vehicle on your own, lest you're going to get stuck with whatever I come up with. But the only vehicle in our family that does not have a name, ironically, is my mom's 2003 Toyota Corolla. It's a base model car. I mean, it has power windows and locks, but that's pretty much it. And it's just this blah, pale greenish silver color that she hates. It just, they didn't come in any colors in that particular trim level back then. And my father didn't want to pay for the next trim level up just so she could get the color that she wanted. So I think there's still some resentment there over that. But 
the car is just so boring. It has no personality whatsoever. So it hasn't really warranted a name. We just call it Mom's Corolla. But it does run. So, but I did name my mother-in-law's car when we bought her a Toyota RAV4 a few years ago. I named that one Rachel. It just kind of popped into my head. And she also has an old second gen Eclipse that's kind of her little fun backup car. That's the same generation that our race car is based off of. But I named that one Esmeralda. And I chose that because my husband's family's Puerto Rican. So I wanted to pick a Latina name for that particular car. Now, my friend Patty, who is a wildlife photographer, it totally made sense to name her Prius Petunia. So we liked Petunia, but she also had an old Chevy cargo van that it just felt like one of those reliable, trustworthy, handyman kind of guys that you could call and he could do anything for you, fix anything, help you out. So for some reason, that van just said its name was Charlie. That just made sense to me. So I named the van Charlie. That's an example of a vehicle that just felt like a guy to me. Now, of course, my friend's beautiful Ferrari F430, I had to name Francesca because it's Italian. And then that car deserves a beautiful, elegant name like Francesca. So he let me name his Ferrari. So that is my methodology for naming cars. Again, you do not have to follow it, but I do encourage you, if you have not done so already, to name your car. Make it a part of your family so that you feel the need to take good care of it. And then hopefully your car will in turn will also take care of you. If you have named your car or now you are inspired to name your car and you come up with one, I want to know about it. So leave a comment or go to my website, thecarchick.com and just shoot me a note and say, hey, this is what kind of car I have and this is its name. I want to know. It's a lot of fun for those of us that believe in naming our cars to, to share in that. It's like other people showing off pictures of your babies. We like to talk about our cars. So I hope that was entertaining for you guys. I know it's not, you know, money saving, hardcore, useful information, but maybe it will save you money in lower repair costs down the road because your car will feel more loved. All right, folks, I'm out of here. Drive safely until next time. The Straight Shift Podcast is copyright Leanne Shattuck, The Car Chick, 2017. All views expressed by guest and or co-hosts are those of the guest and or co-hosts, and not necessarily those of Leanne Shattuck or The Car Chick. Mm-hmm.